Welcome to our five on five. Pleased to welcome back Oregon Attorney General Ellen Rosenblatt. Good to see you. Thank you for taking Great the time. Great to see you, Craig. Thanks for having me. So uh, let's start with Measure 114. Uh, a Harney County judge has halted all parts of the measure, citing state constitutional law. The AP reports your office says the judge doesn't have the authority to make policy on a public safety matter and override the initiative process. Why is that? Well, judges aren't supposed to make policy. Judges are supposed to follow the law. Uh, they're all about the rule of law. I was a judge for many years. Mm -hmm. I think you know that. So I think what we what we intend to mean by that is that the court needs to make a decision as to whether or not the Oregon state constitution has been violated. We don't believe that it has. The federal judge has determined that it does not appear that the federal constitution, Second Amendment, has been been violated. So what we're getting at there is that we want the Oregon Supreme Court to take this case and look at it from the point of view of the law and not the policy that they choose or don't choose. The people have chosen the policy at this point, and that is the passage of Measure 114. And I believe that it kind of has been broken into two separate aspects, if you will. Of course, the magazine uh, rule, for lack of a better phrase, and, right. and the permit to purchase. Is Correct. the state getting closer to being able to allow for the permit to purchase uh, to take place? Yes, I hope so, but it is going to take a little while. You know, we were in agreement when Judge Immergut actually uh, postponed the implementation under the federal case of the permit to purchase until we had an opportunity to get it up and running, frankly. Uh, this is a complicated new law, and it's one that's going to take a little while to get uh, in place. And there was a question about who would actually do the permit permitting, whether it would be the local uh, law enforcement, which makes probably the most sense, or whether it needed to be uh, some other entity such as the state police. So those are the kinds of things that are still being worked out, but I think it, it will all come together. They're just going to take a little bit of time. Hmm. Uh, I believe it was a few weeks ago that, that your office um, announced an agreement with, with Monsanto, a settlement agreement, I should be clear, uh, regarding, uh, I guess, um, decades perhaps of, of, of pollutants in, in Oregon. Yes. Um, that, that money just came in, correct? How much money has, was right. brought in through that? That's right. This is for the PCB contamination that took place over 90 years. Uh, and unfortunately, these, these toxic chemicals are still in our, in our waters and in our, in our lands. The amount of money that came in today mm. is six today, literally, uh, wired to uh, the bank is $688 million. We already had $10 million as kind of a down payment on our settlement with Monsanto. This is the largest uh, state settlement with Monsanto on PCB contamination in the country by wow. far. Wow. So we're really, really excited about having this money uh, in our account for the purpose of, of uh, cleaning up this contamination. Okay, we're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll have much more with the AG in a moment. Stay with us. Welcome back to our Five on Five. Again, we're here with Oregon Attorney General Ellen Rosenblum. We, we spent uh, part one, at least wrapping up, we're talking about a Monsanto settlement agreement between the state of Oregon and, and the uh, massive company. What, also, opioids, uh, CVS, Walgreens, many, many more millions of dollars being brought into the state That's through right. an agreement with them. That's right. They're the most recent ones. The farm, we went after the pharmacies after we'd completed the distributors and the manufacturers. Uh, and that was the earlier settlements. Um, if you add them all up, including now most recently, yes, the CVS and the Walgreens um, and Walmart, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, Oregon's getting, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's going to take a few years because it, it gets kind of dribbles in. It's not like sure. the Monsanto one, yeah, which all came in a big lump sum. Yeah, yeah. But um, at the end of the day, uh, almost a billion dollars for Oregon, or up around three quarters of, uh, of a billion dollars. And this is all tied to the opioid epidemic. All tied and, to the opioid epidemic. As we've these, seen across the country, these these lawsuits, these settlements well, are, are. You know, happening. these companies uh, fueled the opioid epidemic, and now they're paying for it. And you know, they uh, they're they're doing it, which is which is great. Uh, but we also are demanding uh, certain other non-monetary concessions from them, such as access to records that demonstrate you know, that they, they knew uh, what they were doing all these years, that they were contributing to this epidemic mm. uh, by promoting these, these opioid drugs. And so, for example, we have these repositories of documents that will be available uh, from Purdue Pharma, as an example, uh, and some of these other companies, uh, including the uh, consulting firm uh, that uh, McKinsey, that actually uh, did all the ad work for them, that made it possible for them to really succeed at this, um, at getting doctors and getting uh, patients to take drugs that they didn't need hmm. uh, to be taking. You know, look, opioids have their place, but they went way, way beyond uh, what was what was appropriate. So 
uh, I feel very uh, pleased that we've been able to bring uh, those monies in, about 700 million in the opioid space, about 700 million in the uh, environmental uh, Monsanto space. That's kind of been a big part of our work at the Oregon Department of Justice this past year. Uh, I believe you spoke today at an event for CASA, Court Appointed Special yes. Advocates, if people aren't aware. Why did you, uh, yes, is that near oh, and dear to your heart? Tell it, us why you were chosen. Well, it is near and dear to my heart. For one thing, I was a judge, and I uh, had CASAs in my courtroom uh, back when I was presiding over juvenile cases, and I've, I've known from the get-go, uh, even before it was required by law that we have CASAs appointed, how important, how valuable they are, uh, and the relationships that they develop with these kids are life, lifelong and life-changing and sometimes life-saving, as we learned today at the luncheon. Um, it's just a great program, and it complements the um, Citizens Review Board, the CRB. It complements, of course, the work that our client, the DHS caseworkers do. So I don't mean in any way to say that it doesn't take a village. It does. Mm -hmm. But without the CASAs, we're really missing like a really critical piece of the, that compassion and that that knowledge base that they bring. They are able to take the time. They're volunteers, and mm -hmm. they sign up, and they really devote themselves to uh, spending time with the kids and learning about them and then preparing these amazing reports for the court. I used to go to that, that report before I went to the other reports just to, you know, to, because I knew that I was going to get really good up-to-date information about these kids. Thank you for taking the time. Good to see you as always. Great to see you. Right. Thanks for having me. Stay with us. We'll be right back.